All right. So first of all, we want to look at the structures of the uh, external pelvis, the lateral structures. And these are going to be structures that are important for lower limb attachment uh, and also movement because we've got attachment of muscles there. The one thing I want to, first thing I want to point out is um, the fusion point here of the three bones that make up the pelvic bone. So remember we have the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis that develop embryologically as three separate bones, but then come and fuse together. And that fusion point is right in this area around the acetabulum. And the reason I point this out is it's going to be helpful remembering that in as we are learning the muscles and the ligaments in, the, in that area to remember uh, what bone they are attaching to. <coughs> okay, Just to help, help remember those ligaments and where they're at. Uh, there are three major um, features of the, of the ilium that I want to point out, and these are important attachment points for gluteal muscles. The anterior gluteal line, the posterior gluteal line and the inferior gluteal line. So these three structures, we're going to learn um, that the major gluteal muscles attach to those. So just be able to recognize those. Um, they're going to be just little um, protrusions or little um, little ledges in the surface of the ilium. Okay. A lot of the rest of the structures on here are review. You've seen them before, so I don't feel we need to, to hash over them, but know these, these three structures right here. Okay. Now, remember the pelvis is a circular bone. So we've got the, the two pelvic bones and then we've got the sacrum creating a, a full circle. And anytime you have a circular structure, and you put pressure on it, it typically breaks in more than one place. So this is the point of this slide. So commonly, pelvic fractures occur in multiple locations. Can you think of it as when you uh, crack an egg? It's not usually just one break. You're usually forming a network of breaks all the way around. It's the same kind of thing with the pelvis, that, that uh, pressure that's, that's compressing that bone is going to be transferred to multiple different places of breakage, any, any weak spot. <coughs> now the exact location of the break depends on the direction of the, of the force. So a lateral compression here in this first row has a particular pattern of breaks that are associated with it typically. And um, that you can differentiate that from a anterior or posterior compression. It's going to break along a different set of lines. You don't need to know these lines. It's just an example showing that the direction of compression is going to change the break location. And then here, if we have a vertical shearing force pushing up, they're going to have yet again another another pattern of breakage. So lateral, anterior, posterior, and vertical. Ale or Ellie? Ale. Yeah, okay. I can never remember. Okay. Um, so then if we look at a x-ray of a pelvic fracture, we see fracture lines here, kind of tucked in here, and fracture lines right along in here. And what I really want to point out with this slide is, remember all of those little blood vessels we saw lining the pelvic cavity? Well, pelvic fractures typically disrupt these, okay? And so we end up getting a lot of intrapelvic bleeding, creating hematomas. So, and that will end up displacing your pelvic organs. So you see the, the bladder di displaced over to the side here rather than in its typical midline position. So these are, these are characteristics very common in pelvic fractures. Multiple fractures locations 
and lots of blood, <laughs> lots of intra-abdominal bleeding and hematomas. Okay. <coughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So then, in relation to the uh, the pelvic bone, we have the the femur coming in and, and um, articulating with the at the hip joint. I just want to point out that instead of moving straight down from the um, the top of the femur, the shaft of the femur is actually angled in by about seven degrees. So this angle here, approximately seven degrees. What's the point of that? What's what's any ideas why that's useful? Absolutely bringing that center of gravity in, <clears throat> stabilizing these joints here. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we'll go through and look at a few of the important surface features of the proximal femur I want you to be aware of. Obviously, you should know the head and the neck of the femur. That would be, that would be important. <laughs> Uh, but then the ones that I, I want you to pay attention to are the greater trochanter and lesser trochanter and the intertrochanteric line. So anytime you have a trochanter or a tubercle or an eminence or anything, those are all muscle attachment sites. Okay. So the greater trochanter and lesser trochanter are huge sites for attachments of muscles moving the, the femur. You're going to see that over and again. So even on this slide, we see attachment sites for the piriformis muscle, for the gluteus min minimus, all right there just on this anterior view. So this is anterior view. Okay. If we turn the bone 90 degrees, we can see here the lesser trochanter, a little more apparent, this protuberance out of the bone. And again, the greater trochanter, kind of that, that top of the shaft there. <coughs> so again, just, just learning 3D and, and seeing that, you know, some, the, the location based on, on the, um, the side of the bone you're looking at. So this is obviously a medial view. And then, finally, if we look at a posterior view, Again, we see our lesser trochanter, our greater trochanter, and I want you to point. I want to point out the gluteal tuberosity. Okay, so this is a ridge that comes out of the bone. <clears throat> Very important ridge. <coughs> Again, att attachment site for some of those gluteal muscles. <clears throat> And for the gluteal tuberosity, we'll just start now. This is the gluteus maximus insertion site. And since we're talking about insertions and all that, it's a good time to mention that in this chapter and the next insertion sites and origins of muscles are something you do need to know because that kind of is how it all works, okay? Um, you also will need to know the innervation of each, each muscle. So in the trunk, it's not as important because a lot of it's segmental, a lot of it's fairly predictable. But here, when we're talking about uh, structures that are completely uh, dependent on musculoskeletal um, activity for their their function, you know, that's that's what le legs and thighs and arms and everything do. Uh, we we need to understand the innervation and the and the actual positioning of the muscles in these these structures. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? I'm good. All right. So here's some a little more applic applicable. Wow, words are not coming. Applicable stuff. So three common types of fractures of the femur that you would see. Um, so we'll just go through them. The transcervical fracture, so this is 
uh, fracturing the femoral neck. Um, this is often occurs in patients with osteoporosis. Oh gosh, I can't spell osteoporosis today. IS or US? IS. IS. Okay, thank you. Apparently, a spelling is not going to be my strong suit today. So, increased chance of osteoporosis. Okay. Um, with the transcervical fracture, we can have disruption of a lot of different things. Um, blood vessels that are feeding the, the head of the femur, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, but I just want to point that out at this, this time. Uh, a similar type of fracture is the intertrochanteric fracture. So remember that intertrochanteric line? This fracture goes right basically along that line between the, the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. <coughs> uh, these two are what we, could, we would consider to be hip fractures, okay? So we would term these hip fractures. As opposed to a pelvic fracture, which is a fracture of the pelvic bone. Um, so that, that's some terminology that you need to make sure you are very familiar with and don't get confused with because any time we're dealing with a fracture of the the top part of the femur, we're calling that a hip fracture. And fractures of the hip bone are never called hip fracture, so nice and confusing. <coughs> okay, uh, there is a third type of hip fracture, it's called a subtrochanteric fracture, which is similar to the intertrochanteric fracture. All three, all three of those are, are very, um, very often seen with the hip fractures. And then finally, we have a spiral fracture of the shaft. These typically require a lot of force to occur. So uh, often the force is accompanied by a rotating movement, which helps, helps to snap that bone. Uh, so these are something that you would see a, quite a lot in um, sports related injuries. So that's where you get, get enough force put on that on that bone. Okay, uh, to just go back to those hip fractures, so here's a, an x-ray of a transcervical fracture. You can see it here, uh, a thin white line in an area that should be of equal radial opacity. Um, so you can see, see that that is, is no longer no longer um, equal density. And like I said before, hip fracture, yeah, fractures of the hip, so these, these intertrochanteric and also the uh, transcervical fractures disrupt the blood flow to the femur. So blood flow to the femur comes up around the neck of the femur. So there's blood vessels that make a ring all the way around and we'll see an image of that later. And so, um, it disrupts, that fracture can disrupt that blood flow so that the femur then goes through a vascular necrosis. And here is an image where this individual's hip on the left side has uh, undergone a vascular necrosis. And you can see the right side, we get a nice smooth femoral head, nice smooth fit within the acetabulum whereas on the left side, we have a rugged shape to the, the femoral head. So this is uh, avascular necrosis. This is, this is often, uh, again, in, in patients with osteoporosis and, and often the treatment has to be a, a complete hip replacement as they once you have the, the necrosis of that femoral head, you just have to have to take the whole system out. <coughs> okay. Questions? Everything good so far? Okay. All right, so then let's talk about the hip, hip joint itself. So 
first we're kind of just work out work out layers so we're start out with just just the the hip joint itself and then go layers upon layers till we get out um, out of the joint capsule so we've got the acetabulum that cup shaped structure um, and then the the head of the femur attached inside it um, then we add a layer and look at the synovial membrane there so this shows a little bit of the vasculature to the femoral head as well. There's just a tiny bit coming in through the, through the acetabulum there. Um, but what I want you to, to really see is the synovial membrane here. And this, this figure sort of shows it. So between the two figures, I hope it, it becomes clear. Um, this side of the synovial membrane attaches to the, the edge of the acetabulum. This end of the synovial membrane actually forms a sleeve that goes out and then comes back along the neck of the femur and then attaches to the edge of the head of the femur. Hmm. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So on one side, the synovial membrane attaches to the, the outside edge of the acetabulum. And then on the other side, it attaches to the edge of the femoral head but then we have this loop that heads back and then comes back, so it actually forms a big loop along the neck of the femur. And you can see that better in this diagram here. So see, here we have the attachment along the edge of the, the acetabulum, and then we have the, this line here is the attachment along the edge of the femur, and then we have this big fold that goes back along the femoral neck. Does that make sense? Sort of, kind of? If I, if I draw a cross section of it, so here's an acetabulum, here's the femoral head coming in, here's the neck, here's the rest of the bone. So the synovial membrane tar starts about here, out, and it folds back and attaches the edge of the femoral head. Does that help? Okay. Now if we take another layer out, are we ready to step forward? In? Okay, we have uh, the fibrous membrane of the joint capsule. So this is fibrous membrane of the joint capsule. Okay, and this is just a, uh, a layer of ligament type tissue, ligamentous tissue that, that surrounds the synovial membrane. It attaches just, just on, the, on the bone just outside of the, the area where the synovial membrane attaches. And I'll just point out that the fibers are all running this way between the femur and the pelvic bone. That's going to become important later on. Then we have the three major ligaments that stabilize the hip joint on the anterior side. So this is anterior. We have the iliofemoral ligament and the pubofemoral ligament. And this is where knowing the three different bones of the of the pelvic bone, or the, yeah, the pelvic bone helps a little bit because you now, um, from the names, you know that the pubofemoral ligament attaches to the femur and to the pubic bone. Okay, so that's between the pubic bone and the femur. The iliofemoral ligament actually attaches to the hip bone on the part that is composed of the ilium. Okay, and again, see the, the fibers moving moving along that, that attachment site and also slightly rotated around the joint. Um, the iliofemoral ligament is considered by some to be the strongest ligament in the body. Okay. So um, because of that, you very rarely see a hip, hip dislocation coming anteriorly, okay? 
that that ligament is so strong that it typically prevents an anterior displacement of the femoral head. <clears throat> By contrast, the ischiofemoral ligament on the posterior aspect of the joint, so this is the posterior view, isn't as strong. And so you often get a hip dislocation moving posteriorly. So the, the femoral head pushes out past the posterior lip of the acetabulum. Now, the body has a rather awesome way of dealing with this, trying to prevent this. And so we'll go back to this, this slide here, looking at the, the joint capsule, or the, the fibrous membrane of the joint capsule. And in this point, I want to, um, first of all, identify all the components of the joint capsule. So the synovial membrane, the fibrous membrane of the joint capsule, and the three ligaments, the ilio, femoral, the ischiofemoral, and the pubofemoral all compose the joint capsule. Those are all, all one structure and there's not a really good definition between those three ligaments that we talked about. They all kind of just mesh together and so like in a hip replacement surgery instead of saying oh I'm going to cut through the iliofemoral uh, ligament they're just going to open up the joint capsule. So that's terminology you need to know cut that whole fibrous connective tissue layers and all and the synovium membrane all of that is considered the joint capsule <coughs> I remember I talked about how the fibers are aligned and this is where it becomes important so um, the the hip joint does a lot of rotating movements right is that ball and socket and so because of the arrangement of these fibers uh, what happens is every time the hip joint rotates, it actually twists those, those fibers and that, the, that twisting motion pulls the two bones of the hip joint together. As you can see with these cylinders, so with the cylinder not rotated, we have the full extension of the fibers in between it, but as we rotate them in opposite directions, those fibers, they're not going to change length. So as they're rotated, they're actually going to pull the two, the two halves of the cylinder together. And that's the same thing that's happening in the hip joint. So that's how you can have you know, a relatively shallow cup with this, this ball in it and be able to have that huge range of motion and be able to, to maintain joint stability. But every rotating movement that you have is actually cinching those two together. Does that make sense? Any questions? Good. Okay. All right. So hip dislocations. So often, uh, when you have hip dislocation, it's a force that is transmitted along the femur, pushing it out of the socket. And as I mentioned, the posterior dislocation is most common because that's. That ischiofemoral ligament is the weakest of the three. So we get that, that femoral head getting pushed out over the edge of the, the acetabulum. Hmm. Now, yeah, sometimes there's enough force to fracture the neck of the femur as well, especially in an individual who has uh, weaker bones, say like with osteoporosis. Uh, so in treating these, the first thing you need to do is ascertain whether or not you have a fracture of the bone. Um, and then you can make the decision of whether you, you can do a closed reduction of the dislocated joint or you have to go in and surgically reduce it. So if there's no fracture, then we have several different techniques that we can use to reduce the joint. These are just two common ones. I'm not going to have you learn the name. It just uh, more is a application type type concept. So um, basically, they have the joint or the, the pelvic bone, the hip bone stabilized, and then using uh, traction and rotational movement, they try to ease the the hip 
joint back together. So ease that femoral head back over the lip of the acetabulum. You can either do it with the patient on its back or um, on, on a table. Um, now, why, why would you use this, this rotational movement? What, what do you think? Why not just kind of yank things? You don't want to tear anything else, yep. And remember, you've got a lip of bone, and too much force could potentially cause damage to the bone as well. So that gentle traction and rotational movement, they tried to just ease it in without, without tearing too much more, causing too much more damage. Often, they have to go through several different types of, of attempts at reduction before they, they will get the, the joint to successfully reduce. <coughs> hey, any questions? Everything clear? Mm. One thing I forgot to mention with the synovial membrane, that big fold that comes back actually is part of the reason why you can have such a huge mobility of the joint because you've got that big loop of, of synovial membrane allowing, allowing some uh, movement of that whole joint capsule. If it was just a little layer, between the, the two edges of the joint, that could potentially be ripped as you have a huge range of motion. But because there's that big recess, there's, there's more, um, more potential range of motion. Make sense? Cool. Okay. Then, uh, blood supply to the hip joint. So like I said, when we were looking at those x-rays, there's a ring of vessels that comes and surrounds the um, neck of the femur and sends projections up to the head of the femur. And that's what these guys are. Um, they're branches of the femoral artery, branches of the superior and inferior gluteal arteries. So all of those major arteries that are coming through the, the lateral pelvis and moving into either gluteal region or the rest of the lower limb, send branches out to form this, this ring of vessels that supplies the femoral head. And so just by looking at the, the image, you can see that, you know, especially with like a displaced fracture of the hip, those could get really uh, torn up. And that's where you get the, the increased likelihood of a vascular necrosis. Okay. I'm not going to have you memorize these arteries. They're small. I want you to know the concept. Just the ring of vessels. <coughs> okay. All right, so then this is a figure that should be starting to look very familiar. <laughs> um, so again, movement of structures through gateways from the pelvic cavity or the abdominal cavity into the limb. Uh, so a lot of them we're familiar with, so this gap between the pelvic bone and the inguinal ligament, um, all the different foramens that we've been talking about, foramina, so here. Um, use this slide to help organize the material for you. That, that's, that is why I have it in here. Um, yeah, we've studied all the different foramina and you've looked at what goes through it before. And having a list that you memorize, I don't think is terribly useful, but as we learn more of the structures of the, of the lower limb, these are, these are gonna help this, this slide could potentially help you put it all in place. So knowing the aperture this, that a structure comes out of will help you remember, help you remember which region of the, of the lower limb it, it's traveling to. So like the, uh, the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen, um, those are all foramina that are moving out posterior and laterally. And so the structures that move through that are typically going to innervate or supply either the gluteal region or the posterior compartment of the thigh and leg. So use this to help organize the information. Remember what, what's moving posterior, 
on the posterior compartments, what's moving medial compartments, etc. Okay. Hmm. All right, so we'll talk about a couple of those structures that do move through. Um, so we have the lumbosacral plexus. That's um, a lot of those spinal nerves join together and then separate out. And there's a few nerves that we've becoming very familiar with. And I, again, we're going to hit them again because they're important. So the obturator nerve here. And what are the spinal nerves that make up the obturator nerve that send projections to that? Okay, L2 to L4. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we have the femoral nerve. And that one also is L2 to L4. So you can see uh, the femoral nerve coming down through the lower parts of the abdominal cavity and then exiting through this subinguinal ligament gap here. And then our sciatic nerve, which of course is very important, um, and that is which spinal nerves? Yeah, L4 through S3. Okay, so. You can see L3 and L4 and 5, and then S1, 2, 3 there. Okay, so then positioning and apertures that these move through, um, the obturator nerve moves through which aperture? Obturator canal, right? Uh, and so then that right here, location is kind of medial. This nerve is predominantly going to supply the medial compartment of the thigh. Okay. What about the femoral nerve? Where do you think, what is it going to, going to supply? Mm -hmm. Anterior thigh. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. And then finally, the sciatic nerve. What is it emerging through? Greater sciatic foramen, right? And so that is going posteriorly, right? So what is it likely to supply? Hmm? Posterior compartment of the thigh, yep. Yep and almost all of the leg and the foot. So the sciatic nerve is the predominant nerve that we're gonna talk about when we get down to the leg and the foot, okay? All right. There's just a couple of um, the arteries I want to point out. And these should be no-brainers for you guys. This is, this is easy stuff. So remember, the external iliac artery continues on as the femoral artery once it passes underneath the inguinal ligament. <clears throat> then we have, we call the internal iliac artery splitting into its anterior and posterior trunks. And we have the superior gluteal artery and the inferior gluteal artery traveling out of the, which aperture? Greater sciatic foramen. Good. So then not only from the names can we tell that the superior and inferior gluteal artery are probably going to, to supply the gluteal region, we also tell it from the fact that they are exiting through the uh, superior, the greater sciatic foramen, so headed to the posterior compartment of the lower limb. Okay, makes sense. Does this help organize this stuff a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Good. Any questions about things? So, nice easy lecture to start off after fall break. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs>
So we'll see you tomorrow. <coughs> oh, God. Yeah.